We had been driving for over two hours when the nightmare began. The anomalous behavior that would affect the area started as abruptly as a lightning strike. I felt strange and disassociated. Goosebumps rose all over my arms as a smell like ozone filled the air, filtering through the air vents in thick invisible clouds. I'm so excited to see this. My girlfriend Alice cried happily in the passenger seat. And do you know that I've never seen a full solar eclipse before? I glanced over feeling nervous, yet Alice didn't seem affected in the slightest. I wiped my forehead, clearing the trickles of sweat that had begun forming there. Do you smell that? I asked, changing the mood abruptly. Alice glanced over at me, the smile falling off her face in a space of a moment. She shook her head. No, smell what? She said, and I gave her a look of disbelief. The smell of ozone was so thick that I could almost taste it at the back of my throat. I repressed an urge to gag. I rolled down the windows. The breeze cleared out some of the smell, but I still caught hints of it even on the fresh currents of air that streamed through the car. All around us, the sky shone a cyanic blue, covering the earth like a suffocating blanket. Mountain ranges loomed overhead, their sharp peaks hidden under fresh, virgin snow. We planned to hike to the top of the highest peak before the solar eclipse began. This whole place is so empty, Alice said, brushing a lock of blonde hair the color of platinum over her ear. I can't remember the last time that I saw a house. She took out her phone. She flicked on the screen before heaving a deep sigh. And we get absolutely no service all the way out here. You better not get injured. We won't be able to call for help. And I laughed nervously, wondering if she had just jinxed us. You're the one who's accident prone, I said, starting to relax slightly. The last trace of the foul ozone smell had dissipated by now. The clean mountain air and majestic landscapes rising all around us made the place seem like some kind of wonderland, far removed from these small sufferings and agonies of daily life. After another 20 minutes of driving surrounded on all sides by dark forests filled with evergreens and shadows, we saw a faded brown sign reading, to Mount Bloodstone, five miles. Oh, finally, Alice cried triumphantly, her whole expression changing into one of excitement. I've never been here before, but Caitlin told me this place has the best view in the county. As the mountain loomed in front of us like a crouching giant, I could see why. It towered over all the surrounding mountains, its sharp, white peak stabbing upwards into the blue sky like a spire. The steep cliffs of light brown stone surrounded it on all sides. Untouched forests of maple, oak, and pine grew thick and vibrant on Mount Bloodstone's rocky soil. We still have four hours until the eclipse starts, Alice said, looking down at her cell phone. The pavement suddenly ended and the room turned into a snaking path of tread marks and loose stone. My SUV handled it easily, but it was slow going. A few minutes later, we broke out through the forest and thick brush that had carpeted the land. On the driver's side stood a cliff of jutting rectangular stones and a drop of hundreds of feet to a field of massive stones far below us if I accidentally veered off the narrow road. On the passenger side, there was just smooth vertical walls of hard granite. The parking area is supposed to be ahead just a few miles, Alice said excitedly. I felt sickening waves of dread passing through my stomach as I glanced out the window at the steep drop waiting only inches away on the side of my car. I wasn't exactly terrified of heights and I had no problem going on planes or roller coasters, but situations like this always sent butterflies fluttering through my chest and caused my feet to tingle with anxiety. It was the idea of unsecured heights, the realization that an accidental jerk of the wheel or a tire blowing out at the exact wrong moment could send us careening over the edge. You're not nervous right now? I asked, 
Alice only laughed. Nope, I trust you, Brian, she said, putting a warm hand on my shoulder. Her soft skin reminded me of Schwade, unmarked and unlined. I still couldn't believe that such a beautiful girl wanted to be with me. We had been together for three months and it had been one of the happiest periods that I could remember. I looked over at her with love, taking my eyes off the road for a moment. Suddenly it felt like all of the tires exploded at once, and the car began swerving wildly out of control, the steering wheel spinning wildly in my hands with a pole like a falling stone. I cried out. Alice screamed next to me, her voice filled with mortal terror. The SUV nearly swerved off the edge of the cliff when the metal rims caught on something and veered hard in the opposite direction. The vehicle swung hard into the rock wall on Alice's side. There was the tortured shredding of metal, the explosion of glass. Screams filled the car, but I didn't realize until later that they had come from my own mouth. My head flew forward, smashing hard into the steering wheel. I immediately tasted salty blood as I bit my tongue hard. My vision went white in pain like lightning ripped its way through my forehead. Time seemed to spiral away into something strange and alien. Stunned, I sat there, not knowing what had happened. Brian! Alice's voice rang out from next to me, sounding muted and far away. I felt someone shaking my arm gently. Brian, can you hear me? I blinked fast, my vision starting to return to normal. My head felt like it was being pressed into a vice. A splitting migraine ripped its way through my skull. I groaned, raising my hands to my forehead. I tried pushing on the sides of my head as if I could keep it from splitting apart from simple willpower alone. After a few minutes, the pain subsided slightly. I inhaled deeply and spit blood on the floor. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay, I said, though I wasn't sure how true that was. I pulled my fingers away from my forehead, seeing that they were slick with red. I glanced over at Alice, but other than a small cut across her cheek, she seemed totally unhurt. What just happened? She shook her head, uncertainty crossing her eyes. We had an accident, she said, glancing down at her cell phone. She tried calling 911 and putting it to her ear. She gave me a grim look and shook her head. There's no cell phone towers anywhere around here. We're going to have to walk to find help, or at least until we can find somewhere with a cell phone reception. An accident with what? The air? A rush of adrenaline pushed the pain away temporarily. I flung the door open, stumbling out of the SUV. I looked back on the dirt road that spiraled around its way around the mountain and out of view, seeing the glint of steel. Confused, I started over in that direction. Wait, Alice yelled, quickly jumping out of the vehicle and sprinting to catch up with me. You don't look very steady on your feet. Maybe you should sit down. Look at this, I cried, pointing to what lay stretched across the road, dug slightly into the dirt. Alice's eyes widened in understanding as she saw it too. Somebody had set up a spike strip. The gleaming spikes of metal reaching up like claws still had pieces of my shredded tires caught on their sharp points. Someone's out to get us, I whispered nervously, glancing both ways down the dirt road. I had no idea what to do now. We were out in the absolute middle of nowhere. I didn't even know which direction to go unless I wanted to try hiking back dozens of miles to the last gas station that we had seen. The SUV was blocking the narrow road. Further down, I saw a small dirt turnaround jutting off to the side. I drove the vehicle on its rims and pulled over locking the doors. I grabbed my backpack and filled it with my water bottle, a buck knife, and the small amount of food that we had in the car. Mostly trail mix and some candy. It wouldn't last long. I knew that and the water would run out even sooner if we didn't find a river or a stream. I grabbed my Swiss army knife and lighter and put them in my pocket, just in case we'd need them. Which way? Alice asked. It was a good question. This road didn't just lead to the trail that wound its way to the top of Mount Bloodstone after all, but also continued down the other side and potentially to civilization. I had no map so I just shrugged and motioned forward. 
I think we should keep moving in the same direction. The last gas station was at least 20 miles back that way. For all we know, there could be a house or another gas station much closer if we just keep going straight. It was weak logic and I knew that I was grasping at straws. But at that moment, straws were all we had. Alice grabbed her backpack and side by side we started hiking up the winding road that ascended the steep slopes to Mount Bloodstone. We had been walking for nearly an hour when I noticed a strange smell wafting on the breeze. It was that overwhelming smell of ozone, a thick and cloying, just like I had noticed earlier. I nearly gagged, bending over. God, what is that? I asked. It's like a chemical factory is nearby. Alice just shook her head. From the nearby forest, a cacophony of branches snapping and trees falling started reverberating all around us. When I had first heard it, it sounded distant. I looked at Alice at first, wondering if it was some sort of avalanche or an earthquake on another nearby mountain. Is that an avalanche? I yelled as the sound rapidly increased into deafening echoes of smashing and breaking, heading in our direction. A predatory cry rang through the mountains, full of power and energy, reminding me of the roaring of some ancient T-Rex. It shook the ground and mixed with the noise of destruction that came at us like a tidal wave. Alice and I started sprinting blindly up the road. She tried to say something, but I couldn't hear her over the ringing in my ears. Whatever was causing the racket veered away from us and deeper into the woods, angling itself straight up the side of the mountain. I glanced back, seeing trees fall and branches crash. In the middle of this path of destruction, I caught a glimpse of something massive and alien. It slithered forward like a snake, hundreds of feet long. Its body was covered in soft layers of blood-red feathers that rippled gently in the breeze. A deep turquoise line of feathers ran straight down the center of its spine. From the top of its body, two enormous wings jutted out like the wings of some enormous dragon. They had soft, pink blood vessels spider-webbing throughout the pale gray flesh. The wings beat at the air and the enormous feathered snake slowly flew up, its sharp spiked tail ripping more trees out of the ground as it slammed down from side to side. Within a few seconds, it had gained speed, flying up and over an enormous stone cliff and out of view. The world seemed to go silent as the beast disappeared, the echoes of its destruction rapidly fading off into the valleys below. Alice had gotten far ahead of me, and I sprinted up to her. She turned to me, covered in sweat, her skin looking chalk white from terror. Did you see it? I asked breathlessly. She gave me a strange look. See what? she said. When the avalanche started, I ran, I didn't see anything. I stared at her mouth agape. You didn't look back a minute ago. There was some massive animal causing all those trees to fall. That wasn't any avalanche, I said. It sounded absolutely insane, but it looked like an enormous feathered serpent. That's ridiculous, Brian, she said condescendingly. Are you sure you're still not suffering from hitting your head during the accident? Sometimes that kind of stuff can have weird side effects. What, are you saying that I'm tripping out? I'm telling you that I saw it as certainly as I see you here in front of me right now. It was moving away from us and I didn't see its face. But I saw its body. It must have been two or three hundred feet long, I said grimly trying to convince her. Alice only sighed and glanced forward. We should keep going, she said. We're going to want to get out of here before nightfall. It gets cold up in the mountains in April. Well, I've got my lighter, I said. I'll start a fire if we need to, I'm not too worried about that. I am worried about who the heck spiked my tires and why there's a giant snake slithering around the mountains though. But deep down I knew that Alice was right. Regardless of whatever weird stuff was going on around us, we needed to keep moving. I didn't want to be here after dusk either, but not because I was worried about the cold or about running out of food or water. The solar eclipse is only a couple of hours away, Alice said, glancing down at her phone. I really don't care, I said gloomily. I pulled on my water from the pack and took a long swallow. I held it up to the sun and realized with growing anxiety that my water was already mostly gone. 
Why do you think somebody would put spike strips on this road? I asked. The thought had been bouncing around my head, growing louder and more insistent. I kept coming back to the same answer. To ambush, kidnap, or possibly murder them. The dark woods began to feel more sinister. The shadows deeper and darker. I kept my head on a swivel, looking constantly for any signs that we were being followed. Oh, it's probably just kids or teenagers messing around, Alice said, raising a perfectly plucked eyebrow. I mean, who else would do something so dangerous and stupid? As someone who wants to rob or kidnap somebody, or maybe a serial killer looking for a victim, I responded feeling sick. I had taken my buck knife out of my backpack and now held it tightly in my hand, my knuckles white. I felt better just holding it, even though I knew it would likely do no good against somebody with a gun, and that it would do absolutely nothing against that enormous snake if it came back. I looked into the woods stretching up the side of the mountain. Behind a nearby cluster of bushes, a pale face peeked out, something that looked mostly but not entirely human. It had bone white skin and slitted pupils in its glowing yellow eyes. Its hairless face split into a grin. Two obsidian fangs swiveled out like the teeth of a rattlesnake. I stopped in my tracks, stuttering and pointing. Alice glanced over at me. She followed my finger and froze like a deer in the headlights. The creature hissed as it crashed through the bushes its jaw unhinging and jutting forward like a snake's. Its black fangs looked as sharp as needles. Its hiss grew into a gurgle. In the trees behind it, I saw more movement, more pale faces rising up, their slitted pupils radiating hunger and bloodlust. Run, I screamed, tearing off of the road without looking back to see if Alice would follow. On my left stood a drop off of what must have been a thousand feet down to a babbling river far below. The only possible escape was forward. I was already exhausted from my long hike, but I pushed myself forward with every ounce of my will until my head pounded and my vision turned white. I felt ready to collapse. I heard rustling from a thick cluster of brush up ahead. I tried moving past it as fast as I could but I saw a pointed a reptilian head emerge from the leaves, the bone-white skin cracking as its lipless mouth split into a wide grin. Its fangs swiveled out, surrounded by dozens of smaller black teeth shaped like needles. It leapt at me, its scaled white body soaring through the air. I felt its sharp talons of fingers rip into my chest as it knocked me down to the ground. Kicking and swearing, I tried to bring the buck knife up into the thing's chest, but it grabbed my head and slammed it hard into the dirt road. My temple smashed into a rock with a cracking of bone. My ears rang as the world exploded into blackness. Everything spun around me, and then I was falling into eternal nothingness. I woke suddenly, the migraine in my head now so bad that it felt like torrents of lava were burning their way through my skull. I groaned, blinking quickly. The sunlight streaming down from the sky made me feel weak and nauseous. I turned retching, but my stomach had nothing but water in it. I ended up vomiting up water with pink streaks of what looked like blood in it. I raised my head looking around. Welcome to the end, buddy. A middle-aged man with a face like a bulldog said from a few feet to my right. I glanced over at him, seeing that he was tied down with coils of rope to a rough-hewn wooden bench. I realized that I was situated the same way. My hands and feet were tightly tied together. I tried wiggling them free with no success, but dozens more people were situated in a line stretching off into the distance, each of them tied down to their own primitive table of rough planks. I looked to my left, expecting to see Alice, but she wasn't there. It was an elderly woman with an enormous purple bruise over her left temple. Her dark eyes fluttered as she stared at me with horror. More people were tied down on that side too, all of them moving their heads and looking around with dead eyes and expressions of horror. Oh, they got you too, huh? The old woman asked in a weak and strained voice. Her eyes looked far away, 
as if she were already on the other side of the veil that no longer existed in her physical body. Where are we? I asked. What's going on? You're in the town of Nocturne, the man on my right side, his fat face quivering with fear. From what I've gathered while I've been held prisoner here, those creatures worship the snake god, who only comes out during the solar eclipse. Apparently they feed him and in exchange, he lets them drink his blood which makes them immortal. They're not creatures, the old woman said. Those are people. I looked at her. If this situation weren't so grave, I might have even laughed. Those are people, I said sarcastically. With the slitted eyes and the forked tongues and the fangs that come out like a rattlesnake. I'm not sure our definition of people is the same thing. The woman just shook her head. You don't understand. When they drink the blood of the serpent, they change. They started out just like you and me. They're cultists. I raised my head and looked around, realizing that we were situated in what looked like an abandoned town cut into the forest near the peak of Mount Bloodstone. In the center, there was a church whose walls had so many holes that they reminded me of Swiss cheese. The exterior may have once been white, but it had turned to gray with age. Vines and patches of dark mold grew over its wooden walls. Houses two and three stories tall were scattered randomly around us. Trees were growing through the walls of many, their branches and roots intertwining with the collapsing structures. All the glass of the windows had long ago been smashed and turned to dust. Many of the roofs had collapsed inwards. Bird nests and streaks of dirt covered the outside. Next to the dilapidated structures sat what looked like hundreds of cars. Some were apparently brand new and others were so rusted and ancient that I couldn't even tell what make or model they were. They all had ripped open tires. Nocturne, huh? I asked. Do these people actually live here? It looks like this entire town is about to fall into the earth. I tried to think to formulate some sort of plan. I had no idea how I could possibly escape this apparently hopeless situation. But then I felt a lump in my pocket, suddenly remembering the Swiss army knife that I had put in there. I struggled with the rope, moving my hands as close as I could. After a lot of effort, I managed to pull the Swiss army knife free. The sky had begun to go dark. With horror, I looked up, realizing the solar eclipse had begun. The moon slowly ate the sun and the feathered serpent would soon be here to drink our blood in celebration. Dozens of the transformed snake people filtered out of the collapsing houses the church and the surrounding forest as the eclipse rapidly progressed. They moved towards us in a circle. Among the crowd of monsters, I saw a few regular people with glassy eyes and the blank expressions of true believers. One of them was Alice. She held the hand of one of the abominations, its sharp talons wrapped in her soft fingers. When she saw me looking in her direction, she grinned. The superficial charm and charisma was gone now, revealing the cold, psychopathic determination underneath. My father, she said by way of explanation, looking at the abomination with clear love and adoration. He always said I would join the Holy Ones, that I would be able to drink the blood of Kulk Ken. I only needed to bring my own sacrifice for the God. So thank you, Brian. Your death will allow me to rise into immortality, into eternity, into the endless procession of eclipses and feedings that will follow. I was too stunned to speak. My teeth chattered in terror, but I didn't get to think about it for long. At that moment, the trees in the nearby forest started falling with a crash. An overwhelming smell of ozone filled the air, marking the coming of the strange beast. I heard an ancient, predatory roar that ripped its way through the mountains like thunder, and then the feathered serpent's body appeared through a patch of trees. Its blood-red feathers shimmered in the mountain breeze as its wings beat the air. I quickly ran my small Swiss army knife over the rope, trying to cut my hands free, but the rope was thick and the knife dull. It was slow going and under the stress of the moment and the wailing of Kolkakan, it became hard to think. 
As the eclipse neared its climax, the transformed snake creatures raised their heads to the sky. The hissing grew louder as many voices mixed together, until it rose into a wailing scream. As if called by the keening of his many followers, Kokakan broke through the edge of the forest. He had eyes like pools of liquid flame in his enormous monstrous face. Two nose holes like those of a snake were situated in the center of his face. His jaw unhinged, showing off hundreds of razor-sharp teeth that glittered like opal. Inside that gaping mouth in the place of a tongue, I saw a hairless, screaming human face with black sockets for eyes. The visage hidden inside the mouth of Kokakan radiated pure insanity and agony, and I wondered if this was the true face of the serpent god the face that had lived through countless eons and seen millions of eclipses. The feathered serpent lunged at the nearest of the more than 40 bound people tied to wooden planks in the shape of crude, sacrificial tables. He gnashed his shimmering, opalescent fangs together with a crack like a gunshot, and then he carefully closed his enormous mouth over the first of the sacrifices. A young woman who screamed in terror as the teeth closed in around her like a bear trap. The blood exploded from her body, covering the hairless, pale face inside the serpent's mouth with splotches of red. The face twisted in a silent scream, reminding me of some sort of monstrous, eyeless infant, its toothless mouth opened, hungry and waiting. Kalkakan drank with a disgusting sucking sound. As his teeth pierced her vital organs, he let the warm crimson fluid stream into his hungry mouth. I had nearly gotten my hands free by this point. Panicked, I cut as fast as I could, accidentally slicing a deep gash into my right hand. But my adrenaline was so high that I barely felt it. But finally, with a surge of hope so powerful it felt like my heart might explode, I felt the rope give way. I sat up and began cutting the rope tying my legs down as Kulk again moved closer, feasting on the next of the victims. The snake abominations had slowly gathered around the long body of the serpent god. As their fangs protruded like switchblades, I saw them biting deeply into the god's flesh and drinking the black ichor that leaked out from the many wounds. The sun flickered overhead like a dying comet as the eclipse neared its peak. The rope that was holding my legs gave way and I jumped up. An animal panic ripped its way through my chest as I looked back wondering if Kalkakan would see one of his tributes escaping and give chase. But the snake god was distracted by his feast of fresh blood. The eclipse had reached its zenith by this point, and the world had gone dark. The stars came out, twinkling like chips of white ice in the endless void. The wailing of the dying and the soon-to-die rang out like the cries of those in the underworld. I sprinted towards the forest, I was almost there when Alice stepped out from behind a tree holding a large folding knife in her hand. Her eyes seemed as cold as empty space, as dark and lifeless as a black hole. You're not going anywhere, she hissed through gritted teeth. The god must have his fill. She ran at me with the knife raised high. Instinctively, I jammed the Swiss army knife out in front of me, stabbing her directly in the neck. She gave a cry like a strangled rabbit. With the last of her strength, she swung the wicked blade at my arm, and with a burning agony, I felt it slice deeply through the skin and muscle. Warm rivers of blood flowed down my arm, leaving ruby drops behind me on the ground of the dark forest. Alice collapsed to the ground, kicking and seizing. She grabbed at her throat, her eyes accusing and filled with a cold, furious hatred. I sprinted past her dying body. She choked on her own blood as it frothed and bubbled through the hole in her neck. The cries of the dying and the predatory screaming of the serpent god followed me down the side of Mount Bloodstone as I ran in a panic. Still shell-shocked and disassociated, my head still screaming with a burning migraine from the many injuries that I had suffered this day. I ended up finding the dirt road and following it back the way that I had come. I hiked as far as I could that day until night fell. I wanted to put as much distance between myself and Mount Bloodstone as possible. I had a fire in the forest that night and I kept a constant watch. 
I thought that I caught glimpses of pale faces with slitted pupils peeking around bushes, but whenever I looked, I saw nothing. Perhaps I was sleep deprived, exhausted, and my mind was suffering from too much stress and trauma. Perhaps. I ended up reaching a gas station the next day. I felt like a man dying of thirst in the desert, reaching an oasis. With thanks, I looked up to the sun in the sky, glad to see its light burning. At that moment, I hoped that I would never see another solar eclipse again. I remember waking up very tired yesterday morning and the first thought that crossed my mind was that I had a nightmare, although I couldn't remember anything. It was supposed to be sunny so it felt very strange and not seeing the rays making their way into my room through the blinders. For a few minutes I was still in and out of sleep so I ignored it at first but then I jumped out of bed to peek outside the window thinking that maybe I had overslept for so long that it was night outside again. It seemed crazy that could have happened because I was always a morning person. I saw that everything was dark outside. Not that darkness that comes together with nightfall, but the one where you can still see things. The one when a solar eclipse happens. Now that was it, I thought, an eclipse. Although that wasn't announced on any news stations, nor had I seen or heard anybody talking about it. I got a little anxious when I saw people in the street just looking up towards the eclipse sun like they were mesmerized by it. As far as I knew, you needed those special protective glasses so you wouldn't go blind. Yet those people didn't have any. Out of those people, two men started fighting each other. The first one started punching the other one in the face until he fell on the ground. Then with his thumbs, he pressed against the eyes of the man on the ground until there was a popping and squishing sound. The second man was dead. The first man started screaming and ran erratically on the street. He suddenly stopped and raised his hands to the sky and in the same rapid fashion, he started scratching his face with his fingernails. The skin made way to blood and soon his face looked like madness itself had started a painting but dismissed it, unhappy with the result. He then started gouging his own eyes out until he couldn't do it anymore. He died shortly after. It happened so quickly that I didn't have time to react to anything that I saw. I felt bile rising in my throat and my heart gave me signals that this was not an ordinary day. It was to be one of the most frightening days of my life. And so, in what was probably one of the few clarity moments in my life, I decided to get my phone and see what was the longest solar eclipse ever recorded. The internet told that the longest solar eclipse that happened in the last 4,000 years was the one in 743 BC, which lasted 7 minutes and 28 seconds. I woke up 20 minutes before that, I dropped my phone and right before hitting the floor, it started ringing. My best friend Mark asked me if I saw what happened outside and he sounded strange. Strange as in way too calm. I dismissed it and I told him to not look up at the sky no matter what, because of what I had witnessed earlier. He told me that he saw a woman behaving erratically 30 minutes before calling me. What did she do, Mark? I asked. She just took a knife out and stabbed herself in the eyes with it, he replied. Eyes. This horrific event had something to do with the eyes. How long has this been going on, Mark? I asked him again, hoping to get an answer that wouldn't make me more scared than I already was. Well, the sun rose at six this morning, Mason. Then at seven it just went black. So a little over four hours now. Mark told me his voice way too relaxed for what was going on outside. He then told me that we would be safer if he comes over. Strength in numbers, he said. Mason, just look at the sun before I arrive, he told me. Confused, I asked him to repeat that. I said, don't look at the sun before I arrive. Are you deaf or something? Come on, get a hold of yourself, man. He said right before the call disconnected. He's coming, coming to, kill, to you. kill you, a voice echoed. From where, I didn't know. 
I jumped upon hearing that because I lived alone and I asked and asked repeatedly who it was that said that, but no reply came. An unfamiliar fear started filling up my body and mind and I thought about what it meant. Was it my fear of not dying? My survival instinct? I always knew that if pushed to the limits, our body will achieve extraordinary things. Although I didn't want to experience that just yet. After a while, I heard the front door open and close rapidly. Mark was panting as he told me that he barely escaped one of the lunatics outside that tried to catch and kill him. As soon as he had escaped, he looked back and saw a group of people attacking each other, scratching their faces off and going after their eyes. There seemed to be some sort of connection between the human eye and the sun. Maybe you weren't supposed to look at the sun. Maybe that was the cause of people exhibiting erratic behavior. Mark's eyes were bloodshot and his face was white like he just saw a ghost. I asked if he was alright apart from what had happened earlier. No, everything will be fine, don't worry. I'm sure this will pass. We will all be fine under the black sun, Mark said, catching his breath. I asked him to repeat that and he admitted the word in black. It was the second time this happened. Was I going insane? Was I hallucinating? Why was my friend so calm in the face of all this craziness? Why did he not remember his saying some words? What the heck was happening? He has a, he has knife, a knife in his, in his back, back pocket. pocket. He wants, he wants to, to take, take your, your eyes, eyes out. out. The voice from earlier said, Take, take him take out him before out it's too late, he's gonna, gonna get, get you first. first. And then I saw his head tilt back all of a sudden. Foam started forming at the corners of his mouth as he started breathing heavily. He needs to eat. The sun needs to eat. We are all going to feed him eventually, Mark said as he pulled out the knife. I yelled at him to stop. This wasn't him. I didn't know what to do, so I started running towards the kitchen. He came after me, but I managed to grab a knife of my own. I threatened him to stop the craziness, and I pointed my knife at him. Kill him, kill him before, before he kills, he kills you. you. I need, I to, need eat. to eat. The voice whispered once again. I tried to remove the voice from my head, but it told me that resistance was futile. It told me that it was there before even time existed, before all of it existed. And it was hungry. He called himself Sir Mor, the Dark God of the Sun. And once every 10,000 years, it needed to feed heavily on human life and mind. You will, you will look at the, at the sun, sun eventually, eventually and you will, you will see, see my, my true face. face. When you, when you do, do, there will, there will be, be nothing be left of you. Of you. I, I hate you and I hate your kind. kind. It said, and now with voices that flooded my mind. I had to resist. I had to try and survive until it was over. Mark was coming towards me and I threw a plate into his face, cutting it. He then started scratching it some more. I ran past him and I headed outside. I saw the shadows of the sun dancing on the concrete and even that terrified me. I felt the most terrible fear that I had ever felt in my life coursing through my veins. Mark was running after me screaming and scratching his face which was now a combination of blood and uneven red lines. His bloodshot eyes will haunt me for the rest of my life. I tripped and dropped the knife. Mark got me and he forced me to look at the sun. I resisted and I kicked and screamed, punched and twisted at him. The first time it worked, but the second one. He forcefully opened my eyes and pointed them towards the sun. And that's when I saw the hideous face of the creature. Thousands of eyes were covering its black face and he was licking his lips with a crimson serpentine tongue. He smirked at me and then I heard the sound of an ancient horn. The sun was beginning to get its color back, but it was too late for me. I turned around and punched Mark in the face and then I pulled his eyes. My best friend was dead. This all happened yesterday and I've been locked in my house since then. Everything came back to its normal course. I'm looking outside and I see all the people are acting normal. Nobody changed. Maybe it was all in my head. I see some burns around my eyes and I think that it wasn't real. Eyes. I need to take out my eyes. I need help, please somebody help me. The black sun shines in my head. My eyes are for him, my mind is for him. A spoon. I need a spoon, the spoon is my friend. 
I'd take the spoon and I'll get my eyes out. He'll eat them. Oh God, my eye is in the glass beside me. I hear screams in my head. I'm sorry, everyone. Help me, please. April 8th. The sun's not coming up. The sun's not coming up. I can't deal with this. School's starting soon. How am I supposed to get to class when it's so dark? You can't see your hand three inches in front of your face. When I first got up, I figured it was just a super stormy and overcast day, but I knew something was up by noon. The sun should have been up by now. It's starting to freak me out. Neighbors have come by asking for some things they don't want to run to the store for, ignoring the elephant in the room that there's no sun. Apparently, the darkness gets even worse when you try to get out of the neighborhood. It's best to just stay here until this all blows over, while pretending it's not happening at all. Dad was sleeping on the couch this morning. I think he and Mom got into another fight. They're not talking and Mom's been crying, even though she does her best to hide it. God, it's bad enough that the world might be ending. I don't have time to worry about my parents' failing marriage. The streetlights went out and they haven't come back on. And for some reason, there's a strange cold front coming in and it's starting to snow. I mean, outside it looks like Satan's winter wonderland, with all of it being so dark. I can see other houses across the street, the lights shining through the window like beacons in the night. The only reason I can make out anything in my yard is from the light shining from my living room window. Mom and Dad aren't talking. Jesus Christ, you could cut the tension with a knife. I really wish that I could go outside to smoke, but I swear Dad had a stroke when he saw me open the back door. I don't know how he expects me to go to school if I can't even go out on the back porch to get some air, but whatever. For now, I'm just cracking the window in my bedroom and doing what I can to waft the smoke out there. I'm 16, I can make my own decisions. Okay, I guess I'm not going to school. The sun's still not up. The weekend's just been really boring. All I've been doing is just watching the outdoors get darker, if that's even possible. I even started getting ready before I realized, what the heck am I doing? And I went downstairs to ask if I could stay home. My dad gave me his approval and said that I can stay home for as long as it stays dark. It's the first time we really acknowledged how absolutely bizarre that is. And it's the only acknowledgement. I tried turning on the TV to see if there's anything on the news about this, but all I got was static. Couldn't even connect to any local channels, it's all snow. And the phone's dead too. I tried calling Isla and Lydia and I got nothing. Not even a busy signal. It worked last night when I talked with Lydia. She lives just a few blocks away and it's dark there too. Isla lives in the city though, not Bartonville. And apparently the sun's fine there. She said she'd come over today to see if I'm still making up stuff. But I'm not making anything up. The sun's gone and it's showing no sign of coming back. It's not just the sun disappearing, lights are going out too. It started with the kitchen. I went down and tried flicking the light and got nothing. I yelled for dad and said the kitchen ball burned out and he went pale. He switched it and I heard him swear for the first time in my life when it still didn't work. I tried to tell him to check the breaker, but he was clearly losing it. By the time that mom came in, he was babbling nonsense about the lights being taken away, and mom had to help him lie down. I wonder if this has anything to do with why he was at work late for the last few weeks. I don't know what he works on, but I'm starting to go a little stir-crazy and it's making me paranoid. Isla never showed up yesterday either. I stayed up until midnight and she never showed. Maybe she just got turned around, or maybe she forgot. She's like that. Yeah, I bet she forgot. Half the house is stuck in the dark now, including my bedroom. But that's not the worst of it. Watching the street is the only form of entertainment I have other than reading. And I'm getting too antsy to focus on that. I cracked the window while I street watched, and then I heard it. So far, all I've heard while I've cracked the window was wind. But now, I heard whispers. Yes, I thought maybe I had finally cracked and was hearing things, but I pressed my head against the screen to listen better. 
It was then that I heard the clack of something like claws climbing up the side of the house. I yanked my head back just in time to see those claws land on the windowsill. I was frozen when that thing hauled itself up to my eye level. It was probably my height maybe a bit bigger. Pure black with tufts of hair or fur coming down from the top of its head and its shoulders. It didn't have any facial features other than these large pointed ears and bright red eyes. Eyes bigger than my balled up fist. It blinked a few times like he was just as surprised to see me as well. His claws sliced through the screen as I stared at it. I had to be going crazy, right? Its enormous hand groped around my desk before landing on my last pack of cigarettes. It yanked them back and waved them in my face. And then it dropped out of sight with a chittering madman sound. I screamed as loud as I could before slamming the window down. My dad came in and when I told him what I saw, he began to cry. Just crumpled up into a ball on the floor and began sobbing. I had to tuck him into bed. I asked mom what was wrong with him, but she couldn't answer me. All she knew for sure was that he came back late on January 2nd, looking paranoid and smelling like somebody else's perfume. I don't know what's worse, the fact that my dad apparently is having an affair or how calmly my mom said it. Apparently she had been on to him for months and it had been likely going on for years. Years and it was only that night that she caught him. God, I wish I could just go back in my treehouse and hide for a bit, but I can't imagine leaving the house right now. Now with those things out there that laugh and whisper, even though they don't have mouths. The darkness took a house last night. The chittering from those freaks was so loud that it woke me up. We crowded in front of the living room window and watched as dozens, maybe even a hundred of those monsters surrounded the house across the street. Windows were busted in, the door was ripped off the hinges and they flooded inside. The Kinneys started screaming seconds after they got in. They screamed for what felt like ages and all we could do was stand there and watch. Dad bolted around the house after that, extinguishing every candle or turning off any lights that we still had that worked. He shared that they were attracted to the light. I don't get it, but honestly, I'm not going to argue with the guy who's clearly two steps away from a mental breakdown. The Kinneys did have the most lights on still. My thighs are going to be covered in bruises with how I keep bumping into everything every few steps. I can only use my flashlight to write in my diary. I have to leave it dark the rest of the time. All I can do is just to watch the darkness outside the window. Two more houses were ripped to pieces during the night. Maybe the night, I can't really tell anymore. I count days by sleeps now. And now, there's not much else to do but sleep. I am getting better at seeing in the dark though, although all there is to see isn't great. The monsters just took the Kenny's house down. There's nothing left but a pile of wood. The Lots and Jarvis house are also destroyed. In the wreckage, I can sometimes see dark shapes moving around them. More monsters, probably. I wish that I could see Lydia's house, but it's too far away. I hope she's okay. It's clear that my dad prepped for being here for a long time, though. We have enough canned food to last until the end of the century. Something on that last normal night spooked him, and although he and my mom are clearly going to split the moment they can, he still cares about us, even if he did betray us. I'm too tired to be angry and too scared. Maybe turning the lights off was the right choice, but who knows. Reese Gill. That's the name of dad's other woman, or in this case, a man. Boy, this just couldn't be easy, could it? I was in the living room watching the snow when I saw a dark shape dart across the lawn. I almost screamed for my dad when I heard somebody run into the door, but then I heard a voice. God, please let me in. I don't know what made me turn the knob, but the guy nearly flattened me in his panic to get inside. The side of his face was raked up from something's claws, and right after I closed the door I heard something else slam against it, followed by an angered scream. That thing was right on his heels and I didn't even see it. My dad admitted it all to my mom in the other room when Reese practically fell in my dad's arms sobbing about how they weren't just seeing things, 
Mom came out after a few minutes alone, dried-eyed and holding a first aid kit. She patched up Reese's face while Reese explained what had been happening all over the block. The monsters, or shadows as he called them, are in fact attracted to the light. Dad was right, but they also like heat. Reese saw a few of them curled up around a burning house like a bunch of dogs in front of a fireplace. They didn't bring the dark though. The other thing did. Dad and Reese refused to explain further, but apparently that night, they saw something, something unknown. I'm praying for the sun's return soon. Dad turned the heat off and we're all bundling up. I like Reese. That sounds so bad I know he's the guy that's ruining everything for my parents. But he's super nice and he's helping board up the windows so as little light and heat escapes. But leaves peepholes for me to keep an eye out. He's trying to keep the mood up by bringing up his travel stories. Apparently he went all over Europe for a summer vacation after he had graduated. If I'm ever interested, he can recommend the best spots apparently. I'll take going anywhere to get out of this dang darkness. I think even mom likes Reese, or at least is playing nice. There's no room to be mean while the world's potentially ending. And daddy looks happy when he's with Reese. Happier than he ever looked with mom. If I keep crying all over my diary, I'm going to make the ink bleed. I can practically see in the dark like a cat now. Although Reese gave me plenty of new batteries for my flashlight, so my handwriting's actually pretty readable. The monster that stole my cigarettes came back. I know it was him because he made the butts into a creepy necklace. I could use a smoke. He was just peering in through the slats of my window's barricade, tapping on the glass with his claws and making more weird, warbling sounds. Ray showed me his gun. He says if the monster tries busting through, he'll make sure to put it down. I've never felt so relieved. In the meantime, I'm calling it Nick, short for nicotine, and I'm sleeping in my parents' room. Well, my mom's room. Dad and Reese are now occupying a room in the basement. I wish they would just tell us what they saw that night. Nick got in. Nick got in. I don't even know how. I just heard Reese and Dad scream and came down to the basement to find Dad bleeding everywhere and Reese trying to put a bullet into Nick's head. He missed twice and ended up pegging it in the arm once. It bolted back long enough for Reese and I to drag Dad to the main floor to shut the door. Nick is stuck in the basement and he can't get up here, but I do hear him pacing up and down the stairs. Dad's really messed up. Mom started praying when she was patching up his neck. He looked super pale still and he's going in and out of consciousness. Reese is holding onto his hand and he's bawling his eyes out. I think my dad's dying. My dad's dead. He passed sometime well. I don't really know when. Clocks have all stopped and haven't been going for days. It's like time's not even real anymore. It's just an eternal night until we all die. I peered out the window to see the front yard has got a few more bodies in it. All pretty badly shredded, but I would recognize Lydia's hot pink coat anywhere. I think the rest of the bodies are her family, but I can't tell. I won't be able to either, probably even if I could get up close to them. We're all going to die. Mom's just laying in bed and Reese is conning his bullets in between his sniffles. All I need to know is that he has more than three. After we stashed Dad's body in the office, Reese sat both Mom and I down and told us what happened. They had met by the old state hospital, planning on going for a drive in Dad's car while leaving Reese is stashed around there. And Dad never once worked late in his life, which for some reason that of all things ticks me off. He always got on my case whenever I skipped a class or two and all this time. He was practically gunning it from work to go meet his boyfriend. At sunset, they saw the monsters. Two of them not gone in the shadows that surrounded the one that almost looked human. Except he was too tall and too pale and had eyes black as night. The other one was hunched over in some sort of drooling creature with a maw not big enough for all its teeth, but it was clear these two creatures were not friends. 
The king, that's what Reese is calling the one with the shadows. Apparently it attacked first, but the beast fought back. It was then the sky began to grow dark. Despite the sun still sitting on the horizon, they watched the sky grow black while the creatures continued to fight. They got the heck out of there before it became too dark, both going home and telling each other that they had been drugged. That was the only explanation for what unexplainable stuff they had seen. But they both still found themselves preparing. Dad picking up all that canned food and Reese, digging that gun out of storage and making sure that he had ammo. And this had nothing to do with us. The king and the beast just put us in the middle of their mess and we're all going to die because of it. Mom's going to end herself. Reese and I aren't going to stop her. There's not going to be an end to this night, and Mom knows this. The sun's never coming back. Nick is still in the basement pacing up and down those steps. I'm waiting for his friends to show up so that they can kill us all and rip us limb from limb. Reese is going to make a last stand when that happens, but Mom can't bring herself to wait for the sun anymore. She sat me down and told me how much I mean to her, and that she still loves Dad even if he really, really hurt her and that she won't think badly of me if I'm not ready to end it. I'm not, but I'm glad she's just going to take pills and peacefully go to sleep instead of taking Reese's offer to use the gun. I'm not sure if I could take it if I heard the gun go off. I'm such a coward. I should be joining her right now, but I'm too scared. I'm only 16 and I don't want to die. This will be my last entry. Nick and the others broke through last night, right through the basement door. Reese took out a lot of them, but I'm not sure if he's still alive since I'm not hearing any gunshots anymore. I'm barred up in my room. I keep getting whiffs of my parents' rotting bodies and it makes me want to puke. Why, why didn't I just go with mom yesterday? I don't want to die. I can hear them in the hallway though. They're looking for me. They can feel my warmth, even if my fingers feel numb and my teeth can't stop chattering. I can hear them whispering my name. I'm going to make a break for it out my window. I don't have a doubt that I'll freeze to death, but I'll take that over being ripped to pieces. I hear it's quite nice freezing to death, and you just sort of go to sleep. Goodbye. I found this in the attic of a home that I'm restoring. There was a horrible event that happened a few decades back that destroyed a ton of homes, but nothing like this. Maybe it's a joke. Maybe it's some creative writing homework or the beginning of a novel. All I can say is that last night the sun went down, but it hasn't come back up yet this morning.